a lot of viewers concerned that I'm too old to understand a company like SoFi. I mean, when management says, this is how much we're going to earn in 2026, they have no idea what's coming over the next two, three years. And the fact that they've done it before doesn't play into the fact that you, you have more confidence in the management. No. I don't think that you're the first person to write no. a sell article on SoFi. This has been happening for years. And every single time SoFi has blown through expectations, dealt with bad macro environments, like raising interest rates. Yeah, we it, it turned out that SoFi could handle that, but that wasn't necessarily going to be the case. You're not discussing the reward or the upside to the position. And so you're pointing at all the potential downsides, but not the potential upsides. And, and what is the fair value of SoFi in that case? What is the price target that you would place on it? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to part two of the conversation with Gary Gordon. Gary, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. So you wrote a second article on SoFi Technologies. The stock had gone down, uh, what, one cent since your last uh, article. Then, then you wrote this one. Uh, you titled it, SoFi by the Numbers, Watch the Small Print. Right. What got you motivated? Actually, it was, it was encouraged. I was encouraged to write the article by a comment on the last, uh, our last talk. Mm. Somebody said, you know, why isn't he talking about, you asked me, well, what about the fourth quarter? And I said, I didn't really look much at it. And yeah. somebody says, well, gee, how could he be negative and not look at the numbers? So I said, yeah, they're probably right. So I looked into more of the numbers. And, uh, and still, you weren't convinced. Uh, well, uh, I saw a number of uh, concerning things, which is uh, it was the focus of the article and why I'm, I certainly am not convinced. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I thought that there was a couple things that you pointed out that were easy shots to take at, at SoFi, one of them being credit cards, for example. Right. Um, they have not been good for, for quite a long time. And you did actually put that in the article saying it's been much worse. It's gotten a little bit better but still very, very far from, you know, industry norms in right. terms of their, their default rates. Um, but also, to, to be fair, that makes up for such a small percentage of their yeah. overall business. Absolutely. It's not a driver, although it, uh, they bought it. I actually looked. They bought it um, two years ago, and they've actively grown it. Yeah. And the losses have still uh, tracked up. So um, while they... They weren't the ones who started the business. They've grown it without much success so far. It's a very tough business with very tough competitors. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, but the one thing, and now people said I was way too easy on you in the last conversation. Okay. So. Here's your chance. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I find that you point out all of the risks of the business, and you don't want to talk about the you know, potential rewards, some of the good features. And you even said that in your article. You said, I don't want to talk about the growth and all of the things that management wants uh, us to highlight. I want to point out the things that are a little bit obscure. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about the the positive sides of the business, the the the, the growing sides? What, like, where's the risk-reward balance here? So, well, I'd say there's two reasons I don't talk about the, the growth in a positive manner. One is management spends enormous amount of time, and most commentators spend enormous amount of time saying that. Mm -hmm. So adding my voice to that majority, um, I don't think adds much value. Um, I always get nervous when management is uh, hyping. You know, look at look at how it, you know they spend pages and pages on their growth. Um, the numbers I uh, I refer to in my article are coming after you know seven pages of details about the growth. And two, the, the first article I did um, made the, uh, the my key point, which is fast growth in a um, mature industry, like the industries that uh, SoFi is in, um, carries the very high risk of uh, problems. How am, I, how am I getting that growth in a business that's growing I mean, consumer deposits grow 4%, 5% a year. Um, unsecured consumer credit grows 4 5% a year. How is somebody able to achieve much, much more rapid growth? I mean, there's two possibilities. One is I've got a secret sauce that nobody else has. Two, I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing. 
taking too much credit risk on the lending side. I'm paying too much for deposits. And I'm convinced the second is more, much more likely true here than the first. So, I personally fail to see is the secret sauce. And I see evidence that in both cases, these numbers to me highlighted that they're taking, uh, they're doing, they're growing at little or no profit. Um, so on the deposit side, you, you, you talked about how high their cost of their deposits are, right. um, but not unheard of high cost of deposit. You even brought up names like uh, Amex, for example, as right. being very similar cost of deposits. Um, right. Also fast growing deposits, but not even nearly as fast as SoFi, for example. Right. So do you think that there could be an element of a, of a secret sauce or something like this that they could be bringing on? And, and also, I want to add to the point, because um, I do want to defend SoFi a little bit, that their deposits that they're bringing on are from direct deposit users, right? Mm -hmm. That's the only way that you can unlock that 4.6% APY is if you're doing direct deposit. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that is a stickier customer base that if rates start to come down and industry-wide rates are coming down, that people would, you know, have a harder time switching away or higher switching costs and stay with uh, SoFi? Uh, they might, although they somehow switched to SoFi and wasn't that hard. But, you know, so it's not impossible. Um, I would agree if if they really do manage to hold on to um, a large portion of their depositors if rates really fell and they were able to fall in line. That's not impossible. I mean, I mean, we'll have to see the fact that they've had to pay so much and that they have, from my uh, calculations, very high costs of attracting those deposits would make me worry. Sure. And that was actually a surprise to me. American Express doesn't have these numbers, so I can't tell. But, you know, supposedly the opportunity in uh, online banking is that I don't have the cost of that branch system. Mm. So my operating expenses without that branch system should be a lot less. Mm -hmm. um, but the numbers that um, SoFi provided say the opposite. If I look at their their uh, operated operating expenses for the banking business that they attribute to the banking business, less fee income it was 1.9% uh, of deposits. Um, that same number for Standard Bank, I quoted one in there, Webster Bank was 1.4%. So their operating right. expenses were actually higher than a bank's, despite the fact that they're paying two percentage points higher in rate. So yeah, I, that was concerning. And as I then added, they didn't attribute a lot of expenses to the banking business. It probably should have been attributed. So the gap is even wider. So I, I saw that too. Um the non-allocated expenses that you were talking about. Right. Um, but if you, you're, you're talking about contribution profit during that segment of the article, um, mm -hmm. excluding contrib like contribution profit and just looking at the gap statistics for the company, mm -hmm. the gap net income, you know, the, the margins on the business, the bottom line, including all of those expenses, not, not having to allocate them or not, Right. is looking extremely positive, you would say, right? No. Zero to me is not extremely positive. It, it, I mean, I've seen extremely I, positive, and it doesn't start with zero. I, I want to know a prediction. Do you think that it will be zero in 2024? Or um, negative, sorry, negative or, or positive? I would say the odds are it'll be somewhat positive. Um, their real test will come. Um when there's more of a, an economic issue, when the when unemployment rate rises, I think they're the big unknown will be exactly what sort of loss rate uh, those personal loans will have when there's some kind of economic weakness. That was another thing that you talked about was the um, you know the coupon rates on personal loans are looking great, but the mm -hmm. charge offs are increasing quite rapidly. Right. But you didn't talk about the coupon rates rising rapidly. Um, they have because rates rose, but they're not. They unless they can still are still raising prices as we speak, which would be surprising. I would think the only way they can get away with that is if they're starting to weaken their lending standards. But I'd be surprised if they could, you know, keep raising. I mean, I think the only reason they get their business is, you know, their rates are enough below a credit card interest rate where it might make sense for 
somebody to refinance. The closer yep. it gets to credit card debt, the less likely they are to get that business and probably the riskier the business they're going to get. But so they they show off FICO scores. They show off um, average incomes of their uh, lending customers. Right. Does it look like they're lowering their standards? Um, not From versus. No, not versus what they've stated before. Um, but, you know, FICO scores um, are not sort of a, you know, firm fact in life. Sure. Um, uh, a lot of your, uh, a lot of viewers, uh, concerned that I'm too old to understand a company like SoFi. And when I talk about the old days, uh, I'm going to underscore that. But, uh, one, actually one of my biggest mistakes as a stock analyst, this is probably, I'm guessing 2003 or something or 1998, somewhere back there. Um, there was a company called first plus that made, uh, I won't just go into the details, but made high, uh, it looked like high risk loans, very, very high loan to value ratio, home mortgage loans, but only to high FICO customers. Well, as it turns out, some of those people who had been paying in the past, something happened in their life. They lost their job, they got a gambling problem, they're getting a divorce, something happened, going backwards looked good, but they had a life change and they needed money and there was somebody to provide it for them. So not every FICO score, not high FICO scores don't uh, uh, get over the fact that things are happening to those customers and there's higher risks. Yeah. So yeah. I'm not a hundred percent confident that, you know, high FICO score for an unsecured loan is a strong guarantee. And again, the trends don't look good. And the fact that they're growing so fast obscures uh, helps the ratio. So the charge off rate is losses divided by loans outstanding. If I'm growing loans outstanding very fast, I'm increasing the denominator very fast. Yeah. But once I slow, which I, so far I said, they're slowing up their personal lending. Yeah. Once I slow, the denominator stops growing. The numerator is just still grow for some period of time. So we don't know yet what this sort of the stable loss rate is. So they so have at least uh, it's an open question. I'm not guaranteeing that it's going to be a terribly high number, but I'm pretty confident it's going to be higher, maybe notably higher than it is today. Since the company's been public, which is a short period of time, I'll give you that. Right. Um, they have said, you know, where they're benchmarking their default rates at. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's always been higher than what we've actually seen the quarter come in at right. uh, every single time. Well, and go ahead. We're in one of the most unusual periods ever for consumer lending. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, going back in history, we came out of a disastrous recession, 07, 08. Lending industry got much more conservative. Loss rates came down. We had uh, first a stabilizing, stabilizing economy, then a growing economy up through COVID. Down to even before COVID, we had a below a 4% unemployment rate. So all yeah. wonderful for consumer lenders. Then we had this horrific three-month recession when COVID hit, but immediately the government started pouring money into everybody's pockets and nobody defaulted. Yeah. Um, and I mean, literally the U.S. government handed something in the order of up to $5 trillion to U.S. consumers, some of which they still have in the bank. Yeah. So for a consumer lender, this was amazing. So they, you know, really for the last, you know, I would say seven, eight years is about as good as it could get for a consumer lender. So they, they claim they've done well in all sorts of environments, but they haven't really seen a tough consumer uh, in, uh, environment. And they are, so they are raising their question. They've seen the changes in interest rates, but not changes in uh, to the health of the consumer. Yeah. And, and, and obviously, um, I'm not saying that SoFi is with no risk, right? Mm -hmm. I think that the part that um, I think people, whenever they read your article or even myself, is that there there's a risk reward trade off with every investment, mm -hmm. and I feel like you're not discussing the reward or the upside to the position, and so you're pointing at all the 
potential downsides, but not the potential upsides. And and what is the valuation that you would put on a company like this? Like that that's one thing that I I was missing in your article is is what is the fair value of SoFi in that case? What is the price target that you would place on it? I honestly I have very little idea. I don't I don't know enough about the business yet. I mean, hmm. I'm a value investor. Value investor by nature. I, I can't look at a you know venture company and make much out of it. I mean, that's a flaw. I let I let but other you people have an do opinion that. On it, though. I don't have an opinion on it. Um, if they had something unique. I would say yes. I don't see anything unique that they have personally. Maybe I'd, I'd be happy to find out what I'm missing. I don't, you know, what do they do differently in the deposit business that any other bank? I, as I was reading their information, they were talking about the personal advice they give to their customers. Hmm. Well, I've seen at least four or five ads from, you know, other uh, fintechs and banks. Bank America has Erica. The, yeah. uh, some uh, Siri like thing. What what are they doing that's different? Uh, you know, giving a personal, giving out an unsecured personal loan. What are they doing differently? They're using AI. Well, you know, go to the Capital One annual report and search for AI. I, I'll bet you hit it forty times. Well, you know? I, I think I think Capital One is definitely um, one of the. N- newer more of fresh thinking banks out there i think that the capital one's um, been around for 30 years no i, I i'm yeah uh, I'm, I'm i'm aware i just think I, that there is I, a scale to the legacy incumbent banks and mm-hmm. all the way to the sofis and the newer thinking right. like a firms or something like this yeah um oh well, yeah I, I bet jp morgan has heard of ai no I didn't. Yeah. and i would not call sofi in ai play that i really don't yeah. think that they lean into that so, if you it's hard to figure out what their loan underwriting is doing differently than somebody else's. So what's, what is, what makes them unique? So I don't see much unique in them, which, I mean, if I literally was taking this as a bank, purely as a bank, uh, banks today sell for not much more than book value. Their PE ratios are 10 or less, probably after uh, the regional bank uh, debacle last year, they're below 10 put an eight multiple on their earnings this year. What are their earnings supposed to be? For, 20 cents? Uh, for, for this year, about, yeah. I'd say probably eight to 10 cents EPS. Okay, eight, eight times 10 cents is 80 cents a share. That's an earnings valuation. Book value, I think is maybe $3 or something. Being friendly, I could give them four or $5 on book if they were viewed as a traditional bank. Mm-hmm. Um, so what, so the only thing that I have hard for me to get excited and say there's a big opportunity. You, you have to be a believer. You have to believe they've got something unique. I personally don't see it. If other people see it and I miss it, God bless them. But I, from where I sit, I can't see it. I don't think I don't think you have to look too far to be a believer. Look at the the banks that you're comparing those valuations to, and they are growing at snail pace. And because whenever they're, you're their product is growing at a snail's pace. They can't grow any faster. Meaning what? Sorry, say that again. If consumer debt, if if unsecured consumer debt for the United States is growing at four or five percent, yeah, then the average company can only grow at four or about five percent. If the consumer deposits are a five percent grower, the average bank can only grow at four or five percent. But not, That's, but not the disruptor. The disruptor can take market share. They don't have well, to wait for the market to grow. That's um this is another thing i get a lot of what you're you don't get it you, i bet you missed amazon hmm. now there was amazon there is amazon god bless them there is amazon but the amazon model of we're going to be a disruptor make a ton of money has multiple many 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 failures i mean just within the world that i focus on which is you know, basically consumer lending housing etc hmm. um Redfin, we're disrupting the real estate brokerage industry. Redfin has lost money for 15 years in a row. Ever lost money every year they've been public. 15 years, um, and the stock is five today. When I first looked at it; it was 20. And I said to short it. Open Door, another disruptor in the housing business. We're going to disrupt the whole. I sh- I wrote an article on in Seeking Alpha 
uh, saying it's a short at 15. It's today three. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're littered with them. Another one out of my world that I paid attention to Wayfair, they disrupting the finance, uh, furniture industry, home, home goods. Stock was 300 or something. Now it's 50. You know, there's loads of just because you're disrupting doesn't mean you're a profitable concept. Yeah. Just mean it could very well mean you're not charging enough or you're spending too much on market. I mean, there's plenty of ways to take market share. So I, I'm I'm not an investor in the companies that you named, um, well, but I still uh, think it might. God be too bless early. you. Good. That's... <laughs> <laughs> I still think it may be too early to call those bets, though. I mean, uh -huh. there was a point between what 2000 to 2007 or something like this, or 2009, where Amazon's stock price was lower than what it spiked to during the dot com bubble. Mm -hmm. But yet, if during that short period, you weren't paying attention to the fundamentals and just looking at the stock price, you wouldn't have seen that that, that really was a disruptor, even back in 2001. Yes. Right? I'm, I, I'm and, not arguing against Amazon, but I'm saying that model, that that became a business model. I mean, honestly, I mean, I would, uh, because I'm older, I've seen the world before Amazon. That was never a business model. Sure. I'm going to, I'm going to cut costs. I'm going to, the basic goal that I, personally could see is I'm going to, well, I, I guess you could take it back to even the 19th century. The goal was drive pricing so low that you kick, kick out all your competitors and that you then you become a oligopoly, monopoly, where you can control the customer. Um, and I guess we're you're sort of seeing it, I would say, in Uber and Lyft. So their pricing was so low, they drove so many, they had very weak competitors, you know, little mom and pop taxi companies. They drove well, them mean, out. Some of them were giant taxi companies, but well, they giant for a city. But can you name? Um, I'm in New York City. I've lived there uh, in the area a long time. I couldn't name one New York City taxi company. Yeah, there's no giant one. Um, or Home Depot and uh, Lowe's. I think are good examples where they competed against small mom and pop hardware stores and killed them all. And now they're an oligopoly and they can control more of their fate. And Amazon has tried the same thing. Standard Oil back in the 1870s tried the same thing. Maybe that's how it works. I, I, I'm I going to just undercut my competitors. I'm going to do, I'm going to, until I kill them. I, my personal view is that SoFi is not going to dominate the financial services industry and drive, you know, Wells Fargo and be in a, if they had a business. Oh, no, I, I, I don't. I think on the consumer side, though, I do think that there's an opportunity to uh, find a disruptor. There's so many different mm -hmm. um, sectors of the financial world that I don't think that the large incumbent banks are going anywhere. I, so I just want to make that clear of mm -hmm. my perception. I don't think that like this is the ultimate J.P. Morgan killer or something like this. Um, but I think that there is one of the largest total addressable markets that SoFi is going after. They mm -hmm. are bringing over a large share of new members that are mm -hmm. getting into products that SoFi is offering that have no risk. Well, not no risk, but low risk versus lending. So one of the things that they talked about on the most recent quarter was, you know, lending is going to potentially plateau for this year mm -hmm. and financial services is going to see an increase of 75%. Mm -hmm. Do you think that 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 sort of takes some of the risk off the plate for SoFi, knowing that they're diversifying into more products than just unsecured personal loans? Well, that would reduce their credit risk. Mm -hmm. Well, they would increase their profitability. Again, as far once once I allocated the um, uh, the unallocated expenses that they don't do to each of the segments, I came up that their finance business lost $270 million last year. To grow that, you know, can, they can add a lot more customers unless the 200 minus 270 million becomes a positive number. I'd rather not be the disruptor. They had a lot of uh, fixed costs on their. So, so you pointed to credit cards as being a money losing business. I think right. from a credit standpoint, that is. They've got another product, their their brokerage service, mm -hmm. that is also mm -hmm. money losing right now. Right. Um, but it's still them paying off fixed costs from setting up these services. Right. So well, are they gonna, that's also why the margins are increasing so much is right. 
I, I know you don't, you you may not believe in the model, but I'm a huge believer in like I'm I'm full on growth investor. So so it's mm-hmm. a difference in perspectives here, right? That you pay for um, a lot of upfront costs to get the business going and and have a shot at disrupting these incumbent players, and then as you gain a large enough market share, the the margins increase from paying off those fixed costs, and and those customers are there for life or, or hopefully. Um, that historically, by the way, in the last 20 years, growth investing mm-hmm. has outperformed value investing, mm-hmm. right? Technology companies have have dominated the stock market, have become all the largest companies in the world. Um, and yeah, and anyway, I'm just trying to further the point that, um, yes, there, there can be losses in certain segments for SoFi from last year, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be uh, you know, non-profitable going forward. Uh, I can't, obviously I can't say no. We're talking about the future. Sure. I mean, uh, our insight into the future is really not that great. Uh, I think we've all got to be humble about that. Mm-hmm. It's when you're not humble about it, that makes me nervous. I mean, when management says, this is how much we're going to earn in 2026, uh, makes me extremely nervous. They have no idea what's coming over the next two, three years. They don't yep. know what the economy is going to do. They don't know what interest rates are going to do. They don't know what their competitors are going to do. Um, so both the up I was and just the thinking this, this, taking a walk this morning, thinking about AI. I mean, a lot. A healthy portion of SoFi's customer base presumably is some 30-year-old you know, tech guy. Yeah, sure. AI is going mean, to potentially decimate white-collar workforce. Mm. I mean, the, one of the purposes of it is to replace you know, uh, editors, writers, uh, loads of creative people, loads of back office people. I mean, that's, that's the whole beauty of it. Is they can re- uh, replace a lot of the function that humans do. That's their customer base. So I'm not saying this automatically is going to happen, but you know, to make a statement about 2026, I better have a view on that as well and be right. There's just so many things can change. You know, I've got a. I feel a lot more comfortable with. You know, my favorite stock has got a seven multiple on earnings. I'm getting a 15% return today. I have reasonable confidence that that's going to work out for me to have to bet that this company in a very mature business with a lot of tough competitors is going to do, uh, is going to grow rapidly. There's a lot of risk to that assumption, a lot of risk. So not a risk I'm willing to take. And the fact that they've done it before, doesn't play into the fact that you you have more confidence in the management. No, I mean, they're not, I'm not saying they're incompetent. Um, I've said that I would suggest they've had the wind at their back in a uh, large case, but again, because of the health of the consumer. Again, my view, the, the big number for them is gonna be their losses, uh, credit losses. Sure. Uh, you know, are we gonna be in the same position going forward? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I, I would counter the point that they've had the wind at their back. I mean, they lost their largest, they like SoFi was a student loan company for the right. longest time. And then they completely lost that and, and pivoted during, during that time. Right. And now that there could be a harder environment for, for lending, you're seeing them pivot again and saying, actually, we're going to ramp up in financial services. Well, financial services, as far as I can see, is not a great place to ramp up. It's a very tough business where they lost a lot of money last year and we're a long way from, in my opinion, seeing, uh, feeling comfortable that they're going to generate stable profits. I Maybe. <laughs> I we'll think fi- that... Uh... Yes, we'll find out. I'm not... <laughs> I said it's tough to forecast the future. I've got to be humble as my, as well. To, to me, I find that the, the checking and saving account that, the, that they're setting up is a pretty stable business. It is, you know, but what am I paying for that? But, you know, if if I was selling uh, bananas, well, and... well, so that that segment of their business is, is well, as of the last last quarter in the in the three quarters before or two quarters before that is a profitable business. I don't see it. Uh, well, once they again, 
which pointed out only in their 10K. Hmm. So it took some, it took work to find it. And uh, I forget which page it's on in the 10, uh, the 10K, which is a 220 page document. But when they, to uh, calculate segment profits like they do, you've got to, you've got to allocate expenses, uh, revenues and expenses. And there's some issues in revenues, um, but, uh, I wouldn't see anything weird there, but when you looked at their expenses, they had, if we exclude a, a charge for goodwill, the goodwill charge they had, they had mm -hmm. 2.2 billion of normal expenses of that amount. 1 billion was not allocated to their business units. So they're saying of the 2.2 billion of expenses we had, we could only allocate 1.2 billion to the businesses we operate. Where is the other billion dollars? What is that? I mean, I, there's other companies I've followed that have business segments and try to allocate expenses. 10% of their expenses can't be allocated. 15%, maybe. They're, at, they're not allocating over 40%. Now, so now, something's wrong with that. So just on a back of the envelope, I'm not saying I've got the exact numbers, but if I reallocate you know, the, uh, let's say 800 million more of the expenses, mm -hmm. the zero that they earned in, in the finance segment went to zero, uh, to minus 270 million. So or, or, are they yeah. profitable? There's no way I could be wrong in the 270 million, but it's not zero. It's, it's some materially negative number. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I, I'm wondering if you think that there's potentially uh just weirdness in the way that they break down their the like it, they're they're non-gap numbers right so they can kind of break it down how they please but do you think that this is malice or do you think that uh it's they're um, doing it to prop up what they to comment on that and, and it's clearly i would call it at the absolute minimum promotional hmm. gotcha which bothers me i mean the segment numbers aren't nobody's holding them to uh you know a gap standard but this seems egregious. I mean, there's other gap issues. I mean, the only place you can find out the cost of their losses, you read the next, their next press release, first quarter press release, try to find their credit losses. You can't find the number. They'll well, give you a percentage. I, the only place it's shown is in a footnote. It's a, it's one of the line items in actually their fee revenue. It's an offset to their fee revenue, which makes no sense to me. Every bank in the world has a line item on their income statement saying credit losses. They have nothing. Well, I mean, they're they, in a they, bank have a, and have a lending business. There should be a line item, credit losses. It's not there. That to me, that to me is something to worry about. But the number is disclosed, though. So, so you're yes. you're drawing the yeah. line of whether they're putting it in their investor presentation versus ask, their 10Q. Ask ask your listeners and your readers on uh, Seeking Out if they know where that number is. I mean, I, literally I, on page 120 or something of the uh, of their uh, financial statements. So I track a lot of uh, SoFi's data. I we like I show publicly all the all the charge offs for each individual segment. Um, I even do for the the breakdowns, um, you know, per per FICO segment, which you said they didn't disclose. I I have those numbers, so they mm -hmm. they do they do show off those numbers in their ten Qs and their ten Ks. Um, yes, they might, why not in their press release? Every but, bank but, in the world has it in their press release. It's the last year the number was four hundred and fifty five million. It's not an irrelevant number for sure, company sure, size. But, but and why is that in a footnote in their 10Q and their 10K? So that makes it a buy versus a sell, though, is, is how they disclose no, it. Versus... In itself, no, but it's a worrisome sign. But are you even worried about the statistics that they are showing? Like They're not showing them. No, it, the fact that I have to, you have to dig for that number, which is a critical number for a company in their business, is worrisome to me. I would say yes. I, I I don't find a hard or like I don't find it too hard to find the numbers. I mean right. it's you know control F it. type in charge offs. You'll <laughs> you don't need to read every page to find it uh, immediately. You know. Okay. Well, 
Another, just as another quick example, within this line item, loan origination, sales and securitization, non-interest income, which is a mouthful already. Sure. There's a line item, in period originations, loan sale execution and fair value adjustments. You're a better person than me if you know what that means. I, I spent 30 years following financial companies. And they're, that's a, I can't unpack that without a lot. I would need help from the company. $690 million of income in 2023. Line okay. item, I don't even understand what's in there. And that's six hundred ninety million dollars. Can do you I'd like have to it, know? Do you have personally. it on your? Do you have it on your screen? Because from I I I no. I'll have a hard time remembering what you showed off. But from what it uh, sounds like, is there? I'll be happy to send it to you later. It's in my report. Okay, uh, maybe I can go through and find it. But from what it sounds like, is just the income that they made off selling loans and, um, no. you know, other non-interest income for their for their lending side. In other places, they say they made about 40 million selling loans. So I'm not sure. This is, you know, in the old days when I was an analyst and talking to management, I could find that out. But I would have certainly had to ask in this case what these numbers mean. Uh, anyway, I did email them about a company about a week ago saying, you know, would you be willing to talk to me? I haven't heard anything back. I think I'm seeing the the part that you're talking about. You're showing off the SoFi 2023 10K uh, in period originations, loan sale execution, and fair value adjustments. Yes. So, I mean, what 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 part of that is like they they're they're doing loan origination fees? They loan have origination fees are three lines down. So it's not loan origination fees. Uh, for in the table that I have, three lines below that is loan origination fees. There could be more. I don't know. Gotcha. Okay. Loan um, sale execution, fair value adjustments. I would like to know what the fair value adjustments are. Yeah. Um, they did talk about later. They talked at page one fifty seven. We had to get to. They said these fair value adjustments totaled. 962 million by the end of the year. So they had um, increased the fair value of their originations by almost a billion dollars over the course of time. What does that now, number mean? Is that, I don't know, what's the basis for those write-ups? I don't know. Now they don't do their, their fair value adjustments. They use a third party. Okay. Um, so how much of that 689 million was fair value adjustments? And yeah, what, I mean, I honestly saw if if this is what I think it is, and I again I could be wrong, these are they're recording non-cash income. Um they were there's a lot of judgment involved. And I've seen a number of companies that went bust. They're basing their profitability on uh, non-cash revenues. So I, I don't have the answer to this. I wish I did. There's no explanation. I searched, there's no explanation I could find describing this, but if I was an investor, I'd like to know what that number is. It's a big number. Yeah, I'm definitely not the uh, the best person to break down some of the more intricate parts of their their loan sales. Um, yeah. I defer to a couple people that that I know that, that definitely follow this much okay. closer. Um, um, yeah, please ask them, and hopefully they give you a... Uh, an answer oh, there'll be sense. an answer. <laughs> there'll be an it. answer. So I'll I'll uh, potentially add that on once I once I get a yeah. a piece. I'm not, but, I'm not saying this is nefarious, but it's a big number that's unexplained, and it's certainly it's big enough where it should be explained fairly well. I would think for investors. Do you think that there's an uh, a part where I don't know? There's there's a real part to the the actual numbers, right? The mm -hmm. the, the gap numbers that they're showing off, and then there's parts right. that potentially. Are, are not understood clearly. Yeah, even that, a gap number, and I, I did this for a living for 30 years, gap, especially when there's non-cash adjustments, gap numbers are not everything. Sure. And I have companies that I invest in, I revise gap numbers. That's a, you know, they have their view, I have my view. So yeah. I'm not saying gap is the be all and end all. It's a very good measure, but, you know, everything should be 
uh, sort of verified? Are we comfortable with how they got to the number as much as possible? And especially a big number. Yeah. Little numbers I can ignore. Big numbers I'd rather not. Yeah, I just don't, if, if uh, you know, you don't have some valuation or something like this on the other end, like even if you had taken those big numbers out, what does that account to you for? If you're not like, uh, if you don't have a fair valuation or, or for example, you're talking about um, this as a bank versus other banks, but you don't value the tech platform at all. Well, again, I, I desperately try to understand the tech platform. There's maybe two sentences that describe the business, which don't help me. I mean, I've said, frankly, all along, I mean, my expertise and where I, I just, I keep my investments as much as possible within my area of expertise. My expertise is in, you know, financial services. My expertise is not technology. Do I understand that product, their, or that business, their uh, tech business? No, they're selling some sort of software, what the value of it is, what they're making, what their earnings are. Again, their earnings as far as when you allocate ex uh, expenses or they're losing money. So I'm not automatic. I can't look at the numbers and say, wow, there must be something exciting going on here. So I've got to somehow believe. I don't invest on belief. Yeah, I mean, no. Really, I invest on the numbers. Uh, of Maybe course. I'm wrong. Maybe but, I should have believed, but it's a belief. But you don't have to. Uh, so, so you're you're you don't actually have uh, a shorting position on so far. Just to be no. clear for everyone. I mean, I say, would if if you force me to buy or sell, I would be a seller, not a buyer. But you know, is it is the valuation so agree? You know, if I say, if I if I was going to even make a guess at a valuation, I'd have to start with book value. And again, I I can't remember what it is, but I think it's something like three or four dollars. That would be my starting point. So I'd somehow have to say, if it's if I'm going to buy a, side, a financial company with a book value of three or four dollars, it better have the capability for a very high return on equity. I don't see it, so I'll step aside. I'd rather yeah, prefer but... to invest in companies where I'm a lot more confident confident in that return on equity. Do you think that uh, what what I was getting at though is that do you think that writing the Seeking Alpha article saying that this is a sell uh, a, a sell position that mm -hmm. you openly say hey I don't I don't uh, you know account for this twenty percent of the business um, I've said that a number of times but that but that doesn't play a factor in how you uh, should be valuing okay. the company. Well, because I don't understand it, I should give it a high value. No, but maybe, but you don't have to write about SoFi, you know, no. like, or, or at least a hold position and then say, hey, I have all of these concerns. Well, well I have two, con I, you know, I looked at SoFi enough. Again, this was my career. I followed the consumer finance companies. So sure. I was paying t attention to SoFi over, you know, a number of years, not very actively. Um but honestly, I I, th I read a press release, one of their earnings releases, and it was just so hyped. They're so impressed with themselves and how fast they're the, how fast they're growing. And I could see the standard um, adjusting of numbers to look the most positive. I said I got to look harder at this company. And again, I've had thirty years of experience where I've seen companies growing fast in the financial services world blow up so few of them. I mean, literally if it's out of a hundred percent of less than 10% of the growth stories ever worked mm. and the other 90% didn't do okay. They went bust long lists of them went bust. I one, I thought there should be some offset to this hype. Yes. They're growing. Yes. They beat the numbers that they hand out to us in the first place. But the supply demand story is real. You know, that's what I learned over time. Don't ignore supply and demand, one of the basic facts of economics. And the supply and demand supply in their and businesses demand, is tough. The, the supply and demand business. is in their favor. You know, I think if you're looking at the total uh, market, we, dis we will disagree on that. If you look at the total market and you say, okay, you know, JP Morgan owns this percentage of the market, it's yeah. already been taken. Right. Yeah, sure. The supply and demand looks looks poor, but if you're looking at 
someone who's getting paid 0.1% in their savings account and is looking for, you know, better opportunities to make more money, do you not think that they're going to be looking more towards the Amexes and the, you know, SoFi's and these sorts of things I, to move their deposits over? I personally earn more than both of those guys are paying in my brokerage account. Um, both, I have brokerage accounts with major firms plus Schwab. I earn more than that on all three of them. So um, people in the with brokerage accounts who are, you know, more, you know, the, the wealth of the nation, they've got plenty of opportunities way outside of Wells Fargo. And it's a other, a lot of those 1%, uh, one basis point accounts are businesses. Yeah. Business yep. customers where there's no way they're going to SoFi, but SoFi is not going to lend them money and they provide the other services that they need. Um, they, they want to though next year. Everybody. Sure. Go, go get them. Yeah. Get into the consumer, uh, the commercial lending business and get back to me. So, you know, I'll, I'll give you another quick anecdote from the old days. 19 in 1992 and three, there was the first big refinancing booms in the U S where it made sense for people to during these eighties interest uh, mortgage interest rates were very high, you know, 12, 14% interest rates gradually declined over the decade. There was a recession in 91 that took rates a lot lower, huge refinancing boom. So I was working at uh, an old brokerage firm Payne Weber at the time. And a bunch of mortgage lenders went public. So independent mortgage lenders went public. Then interest rates rose. Very clear this refinancing boom was going to die. And when it dies, business doesn't drop by 10%. It drops by 50%, 60%. So it's going to be traumatic. So I was following all these companies that said, I said, well, what are you going to do? I mean, this was early in my career, so I didn't have a clear view. And they said, well, we're only 1% share. We'll go to 2%. Well, if let's say the whole industry is a 1% share. So we got 100 companies, a 1% share. And we all say we're going to two. There isn't 200% share. There's 100% share. Those but, companies all went bust. Yeah, but all those large banks that say they want to get to, you know, 2% share are losing deposits. And SoFi is gaining them hand over fist. So one okay. is talk and the other one's the walk. You know? Well, uh, if I had the choice between Bank America's highly profitable deposit business and SoFi's money losing one, uh, we'll, we'll both make our own choices. Yeah, but but the the thing is, is that if a competitor is it has a money losing business that's eating away at a profitable business, the consumer will go toward like the consumer doesn't care if the bank that's right. uh, you know supplying those deposits that they're making a large margin on. So and how do you win as an investor in that case? So I've got a money losing product that I'm selling more and more of. I own that business. So how, how, I go back to my banana example. I'm buying bananas for three bucks from a wholesaler and selling them for two fifty in my store. Yeah, I am killing that supermarket right next door. There, yeah. I'm killing them on banana sales. Yeah, you know I'm why? Killing them until I run out of money. No, because because whenever you walk in to get those bananas, you're probably going to do a full shopping spree. And so, and so every well, bank I in think, the country has thought Wells Fargo 20 years ago, cross selling, cross selling. That's the business cross selling. Hmm. That's they blew up in cross selling. I mean, every bank does does cross selling. So I don't think that that yes. is is true. But I, I think that, um, you know what, the, the, the Costco hot dog is a money losing business, uh -huh. but it's great for their business. Right. Um, OK. And and loss well, leaders. There's a profitable. What's the profit? I'm. Uh, I've got a deposit with SoFi, a high high cost deposit. What's the new product that uh, SoFi is going to make all their money on? Well, I mean, lending is a so large gonna, part of it for sure. But what percentage of those depositors wants an unsecured loan at thirteen percent? But I even think the, the the depositors alone is not a money losing business. You can say for, it is, but but we'll do this for conversation. A bank, not for them. Sorry, for a bank, it is it's a money maker. For SoFi at the moment, it's a money losing business and fairly I, substantial so far. I disagree. I disagree. 
because so. I think I think yes, you know what you're looking from the annual perspective. But a lot of people say this about like New Bank is another company that I, I used uh -huh. to talk about. And uh -huh. last year, whenever last year whenever I was covering this company, it's an unprofitable business. We'll never invest. Uh -huh. And then you know four quarters go by, and then people said, "Oh my God, the PE ratio is at 500. Who would invest in this company?" Now the PE ratio is, I think it's below 50 or rate right at 50 times. The company's growing so fast that it just clears out all those concerns. Okay. And so so people are, are shifting their concerns on SoFi. Never been profitable, all these things. Now they're profitable. Mm -hmm. You know, okay. but before, like like a year before this one, the concerns were not that uh that that they couldn't get to a, a, a be a profitable company. They they might not even be uh EBITDA profitable. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and this is the, the the thing. I don't think that you're the first person to write mm -hmm. a sell article on SoFi. This has been happening for years. And every single time SoFi has blown through expectations, uh, dealt with uh, bad, bad macro environments, like raising interest rates. Yeah, we it, it turned out that SoFi could handle that, but that wasn't that wasn't necessarily going to be the case. That's not their issue. Rising well, interest rates time. for most the great bulk of banks in the country. That's not their issue. Their issue is credit. Yeah, but but yeah. so so with with SoFi they were selling uh, unsecured personal loans like whole, wholesaling loans. Right. So every single time that interest rates went up, their their book of business that was written at lower coupon rates were deteriorating in, in fair value. So that was the mm -hmm. biggest bear case back well, then. Well, give them credit. They again, I don't know exactly how they do it, but they hedge. A lot of their interest rate they know they're taking a fair amount of interest rate risk and they hedge it yeah um how effectively you never know um but uh clearly i guess that's another thing i pointed out the huge swings in their hedge income yeah um so if they're smart i mean a mortgage or uh, any any uh lend to sell business should be hedging what they call their pipeline they should be hedging the loans they expect to sell, you know, three months later, they should start day one. So I would, if, if they were losing money on that, I would say that they weren't hedging correctly. Mm. It's, uh, I'm telling you, I, I would strongly believe this is a credit story. It's not an interest rate story. And it isn't for, in, interest rates are not the biggest issue for banks. Credit's the biggest interest uh, issue for banks. And that's for very, very uh, unusual, sort of like uh, First Republic or uh, Silicon Valley, who took enormous un unhedged interest rate risk, Yeah, which was a huge issue 30 years ago. I thought the regulators would squeeze that out, but some banks slipped through the system. But for the average bank, that was never their issue. Yeah. yeah. New York Community Bank, which just ran into trouble. It's a credit risk issue. It's not an interest rate risk issue. Hmm. So that I honestly, I don't worry about that with SoFi. I don't care what the Fed does. You know, for as an investor, uh, a potential investor in SoFi, it's what happens to credit. I would say to the extent, yeah, I wouldn't even, I would even say the deposit issue is not an interest rate issue. It's a business issue. Do I want to keep offering an unprofitable product? Or, yeah. Or on the positive side, could I turn this over the long run, this unprofitable product, into a profitable? I, I wanted to um, also bring up, I, and then we can wrap soon. But with um, the the parts of the business that SoFi is highlighting, because I remember the last conversation you wrote, your first article, and you mm -hmm. said this is about a quarter of the work that you would do before you felt comfortable. Um, All right. You know, with with the under. So, does that mean we have two more chapters? By the way, <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm done. What I would need from here really would be information from the company. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these line items we described. I mean, I would press the company, and if I was, uh, you know, you or any other investors, I'd press the company on really what does make you special in banking, what does make you special in in uh, unsecured consumer lending. I, I have my answer. I just I just don't. Uh, think that you would <laughs> appreciate it, or because I yeah. think that there's well, a difference. I'd want to hear. It. I'd want to hear it from them, mm -hmm. from uh, the supposed experts or the guys creating this. You know, I see their their pictures. The I forget what their virtuous circle. I forget what they call it. Um, but I'd need to get more comfortable. If there was something 
so the substantial substantive there and not just hype so um, so the the the, the so. customer counts the product counts the current margins that they have none of that makes uh you no, the, the margins do make a lot of importance to me and those margins are not uh not impressive not not me. yet not yet because, um, yeah, because i can't predict the future it doesn't make common sense to me that they are going to get much bigger but we'll see i mean uh, so I, I learned i that i can always be wrong so one thing that i'd like to point out just in case people aren't um or are listening to this and thinking well you know what we can't necessarily predict the future and so that's perfectly fine but with those margins they haven't been steady with a want to increase them going forward they've been rapidly increasing but starting from a really low base mm -hmm. so has the change in their margins from you know 2021 full year 2022 2023 not impressed you in their in their different segments um, that's a good question i didn't i just focused on 2023 so to do i would have to do some work because i'd have to recalculate reallocate their expenses from 2021 and two um my personal guesses in dollar terms they're losing more money in deposits in the banking business today than they were two years ago because it was small yeah well um, yeah. and they're making more money today in the lending business because they grew it a lot in a good environment uh, so, <laughs> there, I won't be comfortable until I see uh, one the seasoning of the those loans and two what happens in the environment. I mean, if I was looking at Capital One today, I wouldn't buy Capital One unless I was pretty confident that there wasn't going to be uh, uh, pressure on the consumer over the next two years. I mean, during the financial crisis, they're a great company, Capital One. Their financial crisis, they got beat up pretty badly. You know. Yeah, I think that was that was the thing that I was kind of feeling while I was reading your article is that a lot of the gripes that you had with this business were also just simply industry wide, like like charge offs increasing and unsecured personal loans are. Yes, are absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it is it's hard to differ in, a, in these kind of businesses. They're they are not business. They're again, I've been this a long time. There's no new ideas in lending. Every time I hear new ideas in lending, it blows up. I mean, I've heard them, five of them over my career. They didn't work. Um, there's no magic in the deposit business, in my view. It's a grind them out, tough business. And when the environment is goes against you, it goes against everybody. It's, you know, it's a, there's definitely a macro theme in these companies. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. I mean, I own companies that take mortgage credit risk. That's my probably my biggest positions. The only reason I'm doing it is the macro story. I'm pretty confident that there isn't going to be a wave of foreclosures in the U.S., that housing is in short supply. I've got macro working for me, not against me. I, uh, I want to wrap up by saying that um, I do really appreciate you coming on. It's a, uh, it's a new perspective, although there will probably be comments that are not so uh, <laughs> nice. Um, you've been Perfectly more than fine. nice and uh, it's, it's been great talking with you, even though we have differing of, uh, opinions. Um, I'm a massive fan. So, so thank you for, for giving me your time. Uh, you're a busy man. So, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. All right. Well, and good luck. Best of luck. <laughs> Thank you. I will. And and just like last quarter, whenever we spoke from Q3, Q4 was a stellar, stellar Very quarter, well. in my opinion. There might be parts in the company that uh, have some red flags, but what business doesn't, right? So right. That's um, true. I'm, okay. I'm going to continue to hold and uh, and watch those triple beats come in. Okay, good luck. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Appreciate the Take time. Care. Bye.